Bonjour. <laughs> Woof. All right, this is going to go fast. We have 110 slides in 18 minutes. The title of this talk is Jepson 4. There is a Jepson 2, there is a Jepson 1, there is no Jepson 3. My name is Kyle Kingsbury. You might know me as AFER. Uh, I am scared and confused about databases most of the time. I work at a company called Stripe, which provides an API where you can buy things with credit cards. So if you want to build a store, you can use us to do your credit card processing. Like many of you, our API is not real. It's not a physical thing you could go and touch. It lives in a cloud supported by steel girders, uh, which are, in our case, you know, Ruby code. And that lives on top of uh, you know, this sort of shaky foundation of wooden pilings, various gems we've bundled together. Uh, and those are sunk firmly into a, a solid foundation of tires uh, which are databases that we found lying around the internet. Um, so as anybody who has run a database or a queue knows, uh, the pile of tires is on fire. It's spreading up the wood piling, and the job of your uh, code is to insulate you from those failures in a way that allows the service to continue to work, even when the ops team is scrambling to keep things up. So we want to know, in the presence of failures, is the system still safe? And that's the goal of Jepson. It's a systems analysis project to try to understand better what our guarantees are around distributed system safety. So, uh, Jepson is a systems analysis tool. A system is characterized by having some boundary. You can ignore the stuff that happens inside the system and focus just on its interactions with the outside world, the environment. And at the border, there should be certain invariants that hold, like everything I put into a queue should eventually come out again. Um, so we can think about simple invariants over programs, right? Like if I set x to a, print x, set x to b, print x again, we should expect to do a read of this initial value A, then we'll do a write of B, and the value will change to B, and then we'll do a read of B again, so we get A and B, that'll be the output, the prints from those read operations. Reads here are R, W is writes. Now, the program could do something odd. It might read back in time and see a previous value, right? CPUs aren't guaranteed to always be consistent, and so the compiler and the CPU and, and you know, the language together enforce this property that we always get B and not A. So that, that's an invariant. It's a constraint over the history of executions in the system. And our systems are not just single thread, they're concurrent. So we have multiple processes interacting with that same source of truth, same memory register, same node. Uh, and they're distributed, which means that it takes a little bit of time to execute an operation. So when I do a uh, write, it actually is going to travel a few inches over to the DRAM, and then it'll come back. There's a window there, and that window implies some ambiguity in the system. And if we have a write of B that begins and a concurrent read, the write completes and the read completes, depending on the order that those messages are propagated in an asynchronous network, remember we have no, no strict ordering guarantees, you could see B if the read arrives second, or you could see A if the read arrives first. A or B, these are both valid executions because the network is asynchronous. But there's finite bounds. If we're actually talking to a single source of truth, to one place in, in space-time, uh, there, there's this rule that we can't send messages back in time. Things always propagate forward. So the earliest possible state we can interact with is the one just after we make a request. And the latest state you can interact with is just prior to the response, because if you interacted with the later state, it would have to travel back in time to get to you. So this, this constraint about real time means that there's a window of states between invocation and completion between request and response. Those are the ranges of states you can interact with. We call this property linearizability and sort of the gold standard for concurrent systems. It gives us really nice invariants, like if I complete an operation, say a write of B, any future read is guaranteed to see B, no matter what process it comes from. So if I communicate via a side channel, uh, that process will see B, it won't see an earlier value. Um, we're guaranteed a, a partial order, which applies to all events, all operations in the timeline, which are not concurrent. So if their windows don't intersect, you're guaranteed those things happen in order. We could think about weaker consistency models, though relaxing it to, say, sequential or causal consistency, even eventual consistency, where there's no single timeline. So maybe different replicas in the system have different ideas of what the state is, but eventually they should merge back together. You can kind of think of these different consistency models, the common ones anyway, as falling into a partial order uh, with the sort of, quote, strongest things up at the top and the sort of weakest ones down at the bottom. Stuff like monotonic read, monotonic write, monotonic atomic view, read committed, uh, those properties in green those are totally available. It means they can be, you, can, you can satisfy every request on every node all the time, even if the network is completely broken. It's a wonderful property, right? Because that gives us trivial high availability. If you, if you need to do stronger things, though, like read your writes or PRM or call consistency, we have to add a constraint 
called sticky availability, which says that every client has to talk to the same server. And if that server dies, the client has to abort and crashes. Um, otherwise, we'd violate that client's consistency views. And if you want things like linearizability, uh, sequential consistency, serializability, cursor stability, those are much stronger invariants, and they require um, that you cannot be totally available. You could be majority available, so you could have a, a cluster of five nodes, they vote if you have three out of five, it's safe. The CAP theorem prohibits linearizable systems from being totally available, and other theorems prohibit uh, sequential and cursor stability and so forth. So, those consistency models place constraints on the environment and the system interacting. And in our case, for Jepson, the environment's gonna be five clients of a database or queue or something. We're gonna simulate them all in the same JVM process, so we see exactly what they're all doing. We know, we know their orders of execution precisely. And those clients are going to interact with the database, or a queue, or a consensus system, whatever, which is gonna be comprised of, say, five nodes, it's a nice number. Um, they're gonna be connected by a network, and we could interfere with the network, we could kill processes, we can induce all sorts of failures inside the system. But, if the system preserves its invariance, it shouldn't matter what failures we cause. It should always be, say, linearizable or always be eventually consistent. And we can't see inside the database itself, right? It's, it's actual running code. We're, we've got like a 200 megabyte binary. I'm not gonna go in there and trace it, right? But because we're now analyzing the exterior properties of the system, we don't have to. We don't have to care about the messages or the internal state at all. This is a black box. So the clients will generate randomized operations like write the value three or read the current value. They'll apply them to the system and then they'll record what happens. There's three ways you can, you can terminate any given operation. Uh, you could complete successfully, we'll call it okay. You could not complete, and we know it didn't complete. And that's like, uh, maybe you couldn't even open a connection to the database, or maybe it tells you, I couldn't apply our transaction because it was uh, invalid with my constraints. Or something else could happen. It could time out, the process could crash, and in that case, we'll log an informational message and we actually can't tell whether or not that operation will appear at some future time. So we keep it open indefinitely. So over time, these concurrent clients will build up a history of invocations and completions. This timeline tells us the total history of the system as visible from the environment. And then we try to verify certain properties, like uh, does every successful NQ have a corresponding successful DQ? Or for verifying linearizability, can we find a path that moves forward in time, touching every OK operation, and optionally touching uh, those which are invoked but crash. So we're generating random operations, applying them to the database and recording a history of their invocations and completions, and that gives us information about timing, invocation, uh, information about concurrency, which is sufficient to verify that the system was consistent with some consistency model. So, what does this tell us? In 2013, the first analysis uh, went through Redis Sentinel, uh, which entered split brain for the duration of the partition and would destroy all data in one replica when it came back together. MongoDB lost data at every consistency level. Rioc loses data at the default consistency level of Rostrite wins because it uses timestamps for resolution, and that's unsafe for most cases, uh, any case where you're updating, basically. Um, however, Rioc's documentation advises that you use uh, CRDTs on top of these siblings and allow molt. If you do that, you can recover eventual consistency just fine. Kafka uh, had a proposed replication algorithm for 08, which lost data um, because the instinct replica set could shrink to a single node, and if that single node disappeared, you would lose the data that was on it. Um, that's since been fixed. Uh, NeoGB claimed to beat the CAP theorem, and the way it did it was by throwing up its hands and saying, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do during a partition, um, and waiting it out, which is a perfectly valid strategy if your partitions are short and you've got lots of memory, uh, and you don't mind latency. Um, Cassandra uses the same last right wins algorithm as Rioc, uh, it does not offer siblings, so you're kind of stuck there. You can't do safe updates. It will lose, lose uh, data if you do two updates that aren't perfectly synchronized in time. Um, it also has a transactional system, which would deadlock in the early 2.0 release. Uh, and when the deadlock bug was fixed, it would drop transactions or double apply them. Um, so you could lose data that way, too. Uh, oh, Zookeeper also tested in 2013. That did okay. Uh, RabbitMQ does the same thing as Redis. It, it just nukes all cop all data on one replica, um, which means it can lose data as well. Um, as far as I can tell, there's actually no good way to make RabbitMQ safe, which is disappointing, because otherwise it's a very nice piece of software operationally. Uh, etcd and console did not lose writes, but they allow you to lose reads in a sense. You could read past values back in time. So I could write one, two, three, do a read, and see one. Um, that's since been fixed as well. Uh, Elasticsearch loses data in a number of different ways. We'll talk about that later. 
So, at this point in the talk, I would generally provide you with new results, um, but I would like to do something completely different, which means that we're going to go back and do something the same, talking about MongoDB and how it's evolved. First Jepson test for Mongo, May of 2013, lost data at every level of write concern. This is the tunable safety knob. Um, the defaults for MongoDB initially were to cast your write into the void, hope for the best, and see what happens. Um, this optimism delivers wonderful performance uh, metrics, however, it is not quite safe. The new defaults from MongoDB will wait for a single node to acknowledge in memory, for a single node to acknowledge in disk in some clients, or for maybe two nodes to acknowledge in disk. Uh, all of these are unsafe. The reason why is that at any future time, another primary could come along and steamroll your operations, throwing them onto disk in some file, and you can't necessarily recover what happened. This is called a rollback. So if you're using MongoDB and you care about your data being actually present, you need to use majority all the time. Um, even majority was unsafe in this version because when the MongoDB server had a network connection problem, it would check off the OK box in the client, hand the request back to the client, and the client would say, oh, sure, my write succeeded. Um, that bug has been fixed. <laughs> so, where are we now? Um, now means, of course, February when I started this analysis. That was version 2.6.7. Uh, and I wanted to test linearizable compare and set registers, which is where you can read, write, or do an atomic change operation. We're doing this on a single document because Mongo doesn't offer multi-document transactions. So this is as constrained a test as you can get. And an interesting anomaly shows up. There's two phenomena, actually, that appear in this test. Uh, one of them is a dirty read, which is a documented problem with MongoDB. This is where a write to a MongoDB primary, which is isolated, it can't replicate to majority. That write, even though it's not legal, it hasn't been fully replicated, it could be overruled later, it still is written to the local node and will remain visible in that node as long as it's isolated. So any reads you do to that node will see this garbage data. Um, so that's, you know, you could like double withdraw from a bank account and see both transactions depending on what node you, you talk to. Um, the stale read problem is not documented and this is a little more subtle. If your writes occur on the majority primary, any reads to a minority primary that's isolated will see old data. So you can read back in time. You can write A, B, C and then read A. Um, and this is contradicted by the Mongo documentation, which is very explicit that you will read the latest version if you use read preference primary. This is bug server 17975. It was closed as working as designed, um, subsequently reopened, and sh tentatively scheduled for addressing in 3.2. Um, that anomaly, uh, stale read, rules out read your writes and monotonic reads, because you could read A, B, A, B, A, B, uh, which in turn rules out PRAM, causal, sequential, linearizable, and strong serializable consistency. Read uncommitted, being the strongest guarantee in the sort of asset isolation levels, rules out read committed, monotomic atomic view, cursor stability, repeatable read, serializability, and of course, strong serializability as well. What that leaves us with in Mongo, and this is an improvement from last test, uh, is monotonic writes, writes follow reads, and read uncommitted. So now, monotonic writes actually hold because it doesn't drop acknowledge writes on the floor the same way it did in, in the uh, first test. So, we're doing better. But the documentation claims you can read the most recent version that's linearizability. So there's a big gap between what the system claims to support and what it actually supports. If you use MongoDB, uh, the documentation is wrong. You need to plan for stale reads all the time. At any point, you could say, hey, go look at the database and, and you know, see my changes. They might not see your changes. And this can induce all sorts of interesting anomalies. Um, if you need to do safe reads, you can do a compare and set of an unrelated field, <laughs> you know, just kind of flipping a bit back and forth, and that should do it. Elasticsearch. Uh, first test was in June of 2014, version 110. There was a known case of split brain that was documented. Uh, this is where a single node connects two sides of a network partition. Um, and it would enter a split brain for the duration of the partition and lose data. What I also found in Jepson tests was that it would lose data even if you partitioned the network cleanly in half or only a single node. If a primary is isolated, uh, it's possible that you'll get multiple concurrent, logically concurrent primaries. They can both accept writes and then one of them will kill the other. You could lose up to 90% of inserted documents during a test, depending on how you schedule the failure. Um, other things that were interesting, the cluster status can return green, even when the cluster is fucked. Uh, it takes 90 seconds to recover from a partition. This is a hard-coded timeout. You cannot lower it. You can lower the discovery timeouts, which let it detect failures earlier, but it won't elect until 90 seconds have passed. Uh, you can also end up with permanently wedged clusters, which were not recoverable without a full reboot. I'm sure this will be a familiar story, at least if you've run Elasticsearch in production, as we have at a few places. Um, Elasticsearch had essentially no documentation for failure at the time. Uh, but in response to the article, uh, they've, they've really done a great job of documenting things. They have a whole page that outlines all the different ways you could lose information um, with links to bugs and context and supporting information for developers. 
this is amazing. Like, I, it takes a real dedication to honesty and integrity to put that sort of thing out there. Uh, and I think it speaks really well to the character of Elasticsearch's engineers and management. Um, they also closed the ticket uh, for the split brain uh, with intersecting network partitions issue. So folks are still referring to the last talk, uh, and the response from Elasticsearch employees is often something like, well, we've worked on that, and durability isn't a major problem these days. So I'm coming back to test with 1.5.0, uh, in which, it turns out, intersect network predictions still cause data loss. Um, but it's not as bad as it was. Now, instead of entering split brain for the whole duration of the partition, you only have a narrow window of data loss at the beginning. So this is a significant improvement. It's gone from sort of an unbounded window of failure to a bounded window but some documents can still be lost. The same thing applies for single node partitions, for total partitions, and even for garbage collection. Um, so you need to be aware of the possibilities for loss of inserts. Again, inserts are trivially recoverable in any system. The easiest way to merge them is to take the union of all documents. So this is really something that could be fixed quickly, I think. Uh, electing a new primary still takes 90 seconds. This makes it really hard to test Elasticsearch because you have to wait at least 90 seconds plus you know, however many runs you're doing for the, uh, the anomaly to manifest. Um, as a race condition, it's somewhat subtle. You may hit it, you may not. Not a hard guarantee. Elasticsearch, in summary, is doing much better. Uh, they've massively improved their documentation. They've made a number of fixes to then Disco's design, and I'm optimistic that they will continue to improve. Um, however, it still loses data in all failure modes tested, which means that you should store your data in an actual database, and then continuously replicate that database into Elasticsearch, um, which is oftentimes what you want anyway, because search is supposed to be sort of lossy. If you miss a document now and again, if it shows up later, that's fine. Moving on to things that could be lossy. Um, Aerospike is a five-dimensional KV store often deployed in ad tech for analytics or as a cache. It had, it had up until recently, a wonderful thing on the homepage that offered 100% uptime with strong consistency, ACID. Uh, my previous uh, contender for uptime claims was the Sony Ericsson AXD301 switch, which over the course of its measured life cycle offered something like 99.99999 uptime. Uh, so this is infinitely better than that, and I would love to deploy it. Uh, they offer no data loss, real level locking, immediate consistency, ACID, with synchronous replication. So this sounds an awful lot like a consensus algorithm is involved, maybe Paxos, maybe Raft, maybe Zab, maybe VR. Um, I'm going to do a synchronous replica, uh, replication to all copies of data, and then a return. If it got a majority, it should tell me OK. That's, that's a strong system I would like to use. But they go on to say that Aerospike is by and large an AP system, that means available and partition tolerant, that provides high consistency. What does high consistency mean? Well, it means apparently uh, read committed isolation level using record locks to ensure isolation between transactions. Now, read committed is an AP property, so we're good there. This is actually attainable. But they go on to say that for operations in single keys with replication, Aerospike provides immediate consistency using synchronous replicas or signatures rights to all replicas. Read requests, they say, are guaranteed to find the newly written data. That property is linearizability, and the CAP theorem explicitly prohibits linearizable systems from being totally available. So how do you beat CAP? Well, you virtually eliminate partition formation proven by years of deployment in data center and cloud environments. Um, as people who have run data center and cloud environments know, uh, partitions are not necessarily uh, impossible. Um, especially when the timeouts are on the order of milliseconds to seconds, as they are in Aerospike. Um, they mentioned that a key design point is to set up cluster modes that are as tightly coupled as possible so that partitions are virtually impossible to create. Uh, remember, tight coupling uh, is good for reducing the probability of partitions, right? There's a shorter distance, fewer network hops, fewer things to mess up. But the tighter coupled you are, the more likely you are to see correlated failures. Uh, the networks they advise you deploy to without partitions are apparently um, Google Compute Engine and EC2. Uh, this makes me a little bit nervous, so I would like to know what does happen during partitions. If you build a comparison set register on a single record in Aerospike, you'll see anomalies like this one. We do a write of zero, a read of zero, possibly a write of two to satisfy a subsequent read of zero, and then a write of four, maybe an optional write of four. Finally, we execute a compare and set operation from zero to three. That compare and set cannot take place because the value at this time must be four. It's not zero. So that operation is reaching back in time, is looking at an alternate timeline from the read of zero. It's as if the state had uh, diverged into two copies. So we're actually not just losing read operation safety, we're losing writes. Updates are, are being missed. 
And it's not just the sort of acid, um, you know, uh, compare and set operations. It's also commutative operations like counters. Um, if you graph the upper and lower bounds of a counter based on the number of attempted and successful updates, uh, the value in an error spike cluster will drop below that bound over time as partitions occur. And you can get interesting split brain results. We'll tell you like 10, 20, 11, 21. Um, lots of fun results there. I thought I was doing the test wrong, so I went to the documentation, which advised me that there are two modes for Aerospike, AP and CP mode. The difference is that AP mode exists. Um, there's also a feature called application merge. Uh, it was really fun. I gave this talk internally at Aerospike, and uh, they sort of looked at me and said, oh, we claim that still? Um, so documentation, a really hard problem. My software has out-of-date documentation. Uh, application merge would let us retain uh, eventual consistency by handing back both copies, um, and then the application can resolve them. That gives us CRDTs. Application merge uh, also does not exist, um, so no CRDTs for us. Every scenario in Aerospike during partition leads to lost updates. Um, this rules out essentially all the guarantees we talked about before, including that critical access called ACID from read uncommitted to repeatable read. So uh, Aerospike is definitely not ACID. It is a fantastic data store for transient things as a cache, maybe a statistical uh, store, but if you are relying on updates to be safe, you may want to look elsewhere. To recap, uh, Mongo and Elasticsearch, as have all the other databases, um, they've made tremendous improvements in response to these sorts of analyses. And I think the industry in general is moving towards uh, more acceptance of distributed systems testing, especially during failure modes. Um, but there are still some surprises lurking in the depths that you need to be aware of. Um, in particular, when you sign up to use a new database for your service, you're locking yourself into using that database. Whether you sign a monetary contract or not, you're implicitly making a contract because you're signing up for all of its weird failure modes. So if you don't read the documentation thoroughly, you could miss out on the fine print. For example, if you fail to kiss the prints by the third day, your database may disappear. Um, look out for weasel words like strict consistency, strong consistency, acid. Um, these are sort of weasel words. They make us feel good, but they're not necessarily precise. Uh, if they're not accompanied by a more technical explanation, like we offer serializability or we offer linearizability, you may want to inquire with the database engineers what they mean. Figure out the invariants that matter for your system. As Neha told us, you know, sometimes you actually need serializability and it's attainable, and that can be a really good thing. By default, we want to have serializability to everything. But sometimes we can back off to just having eventually consistent things, maybe for counters or statistics. And sometimes we can actually tolerate the uh, violation of our guarantees. Maybe if we know that there's been a problem, we could go back and look at the audit log and try to reconstruct a forensic history. And we can call up customers and apologize and ask for forgiveness. And oftentimes that's cheaper or maybe more ethical than trying to build a perfect system and sacrificing performance or availability. It depends on your domain. Uh, finally, you can't just trust people. You have to test these systems for yourself. Um, think about the failure modes that are going to happen in your network. So process crashes. Kill-9, a wonderful tool. Node failure, um, go flip power switches. It's, just, it's, it's delightfully fun. You can just take this big old grin. Um, clock skew, uh, one of my other favorites, especially for systems that rely on timestamps. Um, you can just set the date on the box, and wonderful things will happen. If you set a date to 100 years in the future on a Cassandra node, you can end up with writes that are impossible to change, so we call those doomstones. Um, if you use fake time, you can actually lie to a process about its get time of day calls, including running the clock at double speed, which is really fun. Um, and these anomalies will happen, right? Because Linux is not a real-time operating system, so we have to worry about these race conditions. If you hit, say, uh, a kernel I.O. pause, your process may just hang for like 120 seconds until the kernel kicks out of its loop. Um, so you can simulate those conditions with SIG stop and SIG continue. That's also a really good way to simulate garbage collection. Network partitions, my personal favorite. Uh, you can simulate with IP tables, dash J drop, or the BSD Solaris equivalents. Um, on Linux, there's a wonderful utility called TC, traffic control, which has options for statistically delaying or dropping packets. Really fun thing to play with. Uh, ultimately, I'm advocating you test your systems end to end. Instead of just looking at a single database, you have to consider the way you're using it, the way your application will handle failover, the way the clients are interacting with the system. All these things together are what actually could determine your failure modes and your, and your invariants. So, property-based testing. Generate random inputs, apply them to the system, record a history. Check the history against high-level invariants, like are the users I registered still there in 10 minutes? Or does a comment I post appear on the blog? And then test those things with distributed systems failure modes. Not just in the happy case, but when things go wrong, what happens? 
This work is supported uh, directly by my employer, Stripe, um, and everybody at the different database companies uh, who helped out in understanding, analyzing, and writing back. Uh, I'm very honored and thankful to all of you. Thank you very much.